first lesson is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, starting from 15 to 17. Jeremiah 31, 15 to 17. I read, this is what the Lord said, this is what the Lord say, says, a voice is heard in Rama, mourning and great, and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. This is what the Lord says, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from, from tears for your work will be, rewar will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemies. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. This is the word of God. Hear the word of the Lord from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were before you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The third reading is Matthew 2, verses 13 to 18 page 966 from the Church Bible. The Escape to Egypt. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. This is the word of the Lord. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Words of Jeremiah, picked up there in our gospel reading, picked up by Matthew. Herod the Great is so consumed with jealousy and fear that a new king, a rival king, has been born, that as you heard from that reading, 
he decides to have all the boys in Bethlehem and the region who are under two years of age put to the sword. That terrible massacre echoes across the history of innocent children's suffering. And today is the day we call Holy Innocence Day. People across the world are celebrating together Holy Innocence Day. Why is it called holy? I think it's called holy because there's something actually holy about suffering that is entirely undeserved and unmerited. Dare we say there's something almost Christ-like about these little boys being put to the sword by Herod. Baby Jesus, for his part, escapes to Egypt thanks to a dream that Joseph, his stepfather, has. Joseph takes him and Mary off to Egypt until the tr troubled times have passed. But these little baby boys in the Bethlehem area are put to the sword. I dare to say that their innocent deaths are substitutionary. There has to be some sense in which they are dying in Jesus' place. Jesus gets away to safety in Egypt. They die in his place. And as I reflected on these readings for today from the lectionary, the first thing that came to mind was the 145 people, mostly children, who were mowed down by the guns of the Taliban in a Pakistani school on the 17th of December, just two weeks ago. And then I remembered Margareta telling me how she'd seen Andrew White, Reverend Andrew White, known as the Vicar of Baghdad, um, talking about the terrible things that have been going on in Baghdad in these days. And so I've looked up the a video clip and, and found it, and we're going to try and play that now. Andrew White will be well known to some of you. He he's quite often appears in Luton, actually, in St. Israel, about the terrible beheadings of these children in Iraq, in Baghdad, where he was the vicar and deep resonances with those appalling events in our day, deep resonances with the massacre of uh, holy innocence in Jesus' day, those little boys in Bethlehem put to the sword by Herod. A moment ago you heard the reading from 1 Corinthians 1 read by Ted. I wondered why the people who put the lectionary together chose precisely that reading for today. I think they chose it because this reading from Paul to the Corinthians speaks of how God chooses weak and even shameful things to shame the strong. It's God's election of that which is weak and vulnerable over that which is strong, which speaks to us this morning. God chooses the weak things of this world to shame the wise, Paul tells us. And they are, it might be said, these little children who are dying. They are, like, they are martyrs in the true sense of the word martyr, which from the Greek means they bear witness to the truth. Not with their words, though they did say those little children in, in Baghdad, we have loved Yeshua, we love Jesus, and we have always loved him. But they, they bear witness to God because of their willingness to die for their Lord and Savior, Jesus. But they're also martyrs in the sense that their deaths point beyond themselves to the cross of Jesus. Each and every one of those little deaths whether in Bethlehem or in Baghdad, point beyond themselves to the Jesus who died for all and the Jesus who dies with all. This is a very serious message coming from me 
this Christmas to you. But this is the shadow side of the Christmas story. This is an important shadow side to the Christmas story. Our culture seems to have wrapped it all up in tinsel. But without this darker narrative of the massacre of the holy innocents in Bethlehem, we have an incomplete picture, don't we? And it seems to me that when something beautiful, wonderful is happening in this world, so often it's accompanied by something terrible as well. The birth of the Savior in the world, Jesus born of Mary, but at the same time, lots of little t boys under two being put to the sword. The backlash, the evil one trying to get in. Satan, the father of lies, putting into Herod's head the fear that this new ba born baby, this king of the Jews, will be a threat to his own rule. Herod, consumed with jealousy, finds under the influence of the sa Satan, his jealousy turning to genocide. But can God use such evil events of this to his own purposes? Can anything good come out of this? I think it's important that we notice that in Matthew's Gospel particularly, again and again, the Old Testament is drawn on as as the well out of which these events are unfolding. This has happened because it was written that. Jeremiah is quoted, Jeremiah 31. The voice heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comfort, comforted. Matthew in quoting Jeremiah is saying, this is happening again now that the scriptures might be fulfilled. This was going to happen. This was even meant to happen, dark and desperate though it is. Micah is quoted. Hosea is quoted. There's a purpose in everything Matthew is saying to us, God is saying to us. There is a purpose in everything, though we haven't got all the pieces of jig the jigsaw puzzle, so we can't put it all together yet, but we will see God in all his glory when he will be all in all at the end of time. There is a purpose in the deaths of these little boys. There is a death in those a purpose in the deaths of those four children that Reverend White spoke of there who were beheaded in Baghdad. There is a purpose because they bore witness to Jesus. And we are hearing again and again, Nigel is often speaking of this, we're hearing again and again how Jesus is appearing in the dreams of the Muslim people at these, in these days. And we are hearing how many Muslims across the world are wondering if there is a more excellent way than the way of ISIS, the way of terror and destruction and death. And they are seeking out and here the Christian answer, you won't find it in any other world religion. Here, the answer comes in a baby born in poverty who grows up and is then nailed to a cross, the innocent victim of terrorism, accused wrongly, trumped up charges against him. Here we find the Christian answer to suffering. God takes it in himself and on himself. And Muslim people are seeing Jesus, the crucified, risen one, in their dreams. The stakes are being raised all the time. So finally, what might be the right way to respond to such terrible evil that we're thinking about this morning. I suggest to you, feel free to disagree, that in most of us, 
perhaps even in all of us, if we dig deep enough into our own deepest thoughts. There is a desire often for retribution. There is a desire for getting our own way in violence of one kind or another. It might not be necessarily with a sword or a gun, but a kind of violence, a manipulative force within us that seeks to just force things so that we get what we really want. We have to deal with the evil within ourselves before we can begin to move on and look at the evil we see so clearly all around us in this terrible world. Jesus' way is utterly unique. It's power not through getting your own way, but as Paul taught us, taught the Corinthians, it's power through weakness. These little children who died in Bethlehem, these little children who were beheaded in Baghdad, preach another more excellent way to us. Silent suffering, like lambs to the slaughter. I'm humbled by their sacrifice. And if we look around our immediate neighborhood in uh, Bushmead and Luton, we all know of lots of stories of little children who are suffering because we adults can't quite get our act together. Lots of little children suffering innocently. They have done nothing wrong. But somehow through that what is happening, somehow in some mysterious way, God is working out his purposes. Lee gave us, um, I think it was um, on um, Christmas morning, wasn't it? A little picture of Jesus. No, it was at the, it was at the cow service, wasn't it? A little picture of Jesus lying in a cradle and asked us to go home and reflect on that birth. Let's hold on our hearts at this time. All the children of this world, all the children of the centuries who suffered innocently. And let's pray that we as responsible adults will somehow be part of the solution to this broken and torn world somehow be agents of bringing about God's peace and love and joy. Amen.